Creality's creating crooked chains, underside underpinning unsatisfactory, and a spicy $850 pillow that I didn't come up with a fun intro for because I'm still a little bummed about it. All this and more Print Fix Friday, episode 159. Let's get into it. Severe layer shifts when using nearly the full width slash depth of the print area. Hi guys, I'm having some trouble with my layer shifting on my K1C. After a few layers, the print head crashes into the frame like it's trying to move outside the print area. Funny enough, the direction changes with the rotation of the part. I tried different versions of Orca Slicer suspecting a bug, but that did nothing. I'm running a K1C rooted with the Creality Helper script. I had Camp, which is Clipper Adaptive Mesh Probing, I believe, running but disabled it, suspecting that it might be at fault, but that did nothing as well. At this point, I am not sure what else I should try, so any help would be appreciated. Let's take a look at the photo that we got here. We've got a K1C. It's having some issues with a pretty serious layer skip, and when he rotates the part, the layer skip shifts the axes as well. I would hedge that something isn't working right, and if we dig a little bit deeper, we can see that we've got some issues with our infill. This is a thought. I'm going to leave it up to the comments as well, whether or not you all agree with me. But my best guess here is that we're running a little bit too cold. And what's happening is that the infill lines themselves are not connecting. We can see it here. Well, we can see it in quite a few of the directions. Actually, is it, is it only in that direction? We, we, we've got some belt issues because we also don't have a round circle. That, that circle is not round. That is decidedly oblong. I think you've got some belt tension issues. That's something we got to figure out. You might have some belt length issues. Remember for core XYs, if your belts aren't like perfect or darn near perfect, the machine won't actually do good circles or really like proper anything. It'll actually be kind of askew. But I believe we might be running a little bit too cold. Work with me here on this one. My thought is is that because it's too cold, our infill lines aren't connecting. And because our infill lines aren't connecting, they're sticking up a little bit, and the print head is knocking into it. It's not getting through it, although I think it should, but for some reason, it's not. And that is causing these layer shifts. That's my best guess. I, and because there's nothing else that we can see from this zoomed in image that would indicate a particular problem. But we definitely have some sort of mechanical issue because that is not round. We might be over extruded. It looks like we're a little bit over extruded, but that first layer does look okay. But that maybe second or third layer doesn't. So my guess is that we're actually running a bit too cold and that we should be looking at our belts. And apparently I'm not alone on the belt tension and the individual saying that's one of the first things that they did. I would check it again. Something doesn't seem right here. I would also verify that your motor pulleys, like the actual toothed gears that are on the motor, are actually tight on the motor shaft and aren't slipping a little bit. If they slip a little bit, it could move. Now, it's not moving in a perfect 45. For reference, if a Core XY happens to skip and it's in a perfect 45 degree angle, that's one motor skipping steps. If it's in anything other than a perfect 45 or 135 or the negatives thereof, it's both motors that are skipping multiple or singular steps. This appears to be multi-motor issues. I would check to make sure all the rods are clean. Just give the printer a once over, give it a good bath, clean off all the smooth rods, re-lubricate where it makes sense and where necessary. But I do think you're still running a little bit too cold. If you do have a K1C and you have rooted it with the Creality Helper script to put bone stock clipper on. First off, super cool that's even possible. Gotta love that. But second, I'd love to know if you've experienced this, and if so, how did you solve it? It looks like it's a bit mix of a mechanical and potentially a setting problem. Some Z-Hop might also help, but I do think we might need to be looking at raising our temps. And speaking of raising temps, my name is Grant. Welcome to Print Fix Friday, where we help get your printers back to printing with purpose. And if you're watching this and theoretically a hurricane has not canceled our travel plans we will be at 3d printopia in bel air maryland tomorrow saturday the 28th and 29th of september 
2024. So if you're going to be there, come say hi, get a photo, hang out, whatever you want to do. We'll be filming all around the event both days, showing off some awesome maker stuff and some awesome companies that brought some awesome things. You might say, it's awesome and I'm looking forward to it, but I'm a little bit worried about this hurricane off the coast of Florida that could potentially throw a wrench into our plans. But it's Monday, so we, we, we still have some, some days. We film these early, if that's not obvious. Anyways, sit back and let's jump right into fixing the next fail. What setting is causing this bad print? I've been using TPU to print these out, but any idea on why the prints are coming out so poor? I've attached my settings for reference. Let's take a look. We got the underside of a print that doesn't look all that pretty. In fact, the entire print doesn't look great. Your extrude temperature is really low. It's an a especially for an AD5M. That's a uh, Flash Forge Adventurer 5M. My brother has one. We haven't looked at one on the channel, but I'm told Flash Forge is coming out with the next generation of it so flash forge if you're watching this hit me up we should chat because if it's anything like the original ad5m it's gonna be a killer deal of a 3d printer i mean the ad5m is like a 300 dollars printer see our layer heights there fine that's a odd layer height but hey whatever base print speed is fine travel speed is fine minimum speeds are all fine all of that looks okay to me this is all of our cooling settings that we're looking at our accelerations look very low I don't even know what slicer this is. Is this like the Flash Forge skin of Cura or something? Use Orca Slicer. You have a fast 3D printer. Just use Orca Slicer for God's sakes. It makes life so much easier. All of these settings look to be fine, at least on the surface. If you notice something that I didn't, please comment it below. I do see that we only have two bottom solid layers. I like to see at least three, if not four. And the 60% of hexagon fill density, that's a lot of infill. But hey, if it works, it works, right? And we can see that we're printing some sort of a model of a foot called unilateral concept. But with TPU, you have to have a lot of cooling and it needs to be very dry. Now, thankfully, I don't think the TPU is wet but I do think we're moving a little bit too fast. So this is the underside of the part. The support material is not really doing its job from what we can see. And th this part in general looks like just an absolute bear of a print to do. This is one of those cases where I would say, if you don't mind spending the money, going to get it made out of like a SLS nylon or even getting it done in a powdered SLS TPU, that would solve this problem without causing, you know, insane levels of complication. But if you do want to go down this route, TPU can get wet and even slightly damp TPU doesn't perform anywhere near as well as really dry TPU that has also been printed out of a dryer. But at least in my experience, and your experience may vary, but 210 for TPU is way too cold. On the Mark 3S's behind me, we run 240 to 250. So on a faster machine, like the Adventurer 5M or the AD5M, you would want to run at least 240, if not higher temperatures. That would be the first thing that I say, okay, we've got some issues. Our speeds are okay, our accelerations are a little bit low, but they're within reasonable expectations. And we can see that it's just the areas around the supports. So, oh, this is where TPU gets fun. If your TPU is really dry, you can reduce your contact distance to like 0.15 or 0.17 down from like a 0.2 or a 0.25. It will fuse a little bit tighter, but it's TPU and it should pull away from itself relatively easily. Be careful that you don't just try to rip it on a part that's thin because you could just delaminate your part, but that's what our general consensus is for TPU. You want it to be crazy dry and a little bit closer. It does seem to help make things stick better. But the reason that it's all curled and nasty the way that you see is because as TPU dries, it tends to shrink a little bit and that shrinkage causes it to warp upwards. And the printer just prints over it because the printer has no idea that it's occurring and eventually it figures itself out. So you can solve this by reducing your Z contact distance, but be careful. Don't go too fast or too much because obviously it's just going to fuse and you're going to have a bad time. 
Speaking of prints being too cold, this one potentially could have gotten too hot. This is what it should look like. And uh, this is what it does look like. This is not a 3D printing thing, but I figured you guys would enjoy it. These are $850 lithium batteries for our Artec 3D scanners, specifically our EVAs and our spider. It's what they use if you don't want to keep them plugged into a wall. We go through a monthly cycle to keep them float charged because, well, they're lithium batteries and they've got a little bit of parasitic draw. I charge them to two or three bars every single month to make sure things are good. And then every six months, we swap them out because we have four total. Two that are not being used and two that are being used. Every six months, we swap them out. When I went to check for this month's charge cycle, I, uh, I noticed some things weren't the way that uh, I wanted them to be. We've got a spicy pillow here. This is a very angry lithium battery. And yes, it's been outside. It's going to stay outside. I'm going to go put it back outside when we're done filming. I thought you guys would enjoy seeing the carnage that is an $850 paperweight. I am debating what to do with this because technically the outer shell is still fine. The circuit board in there is probably fine. Like the battery is only this much. The rest of this is just all circuit board. It might behoove me to salvage components out of this before we potentially Florida man it, uh, old yeller style, if you will. But, uh, yeah, uh, this is you. This is the guy she tells you not to worry about. You're falling apart at the seams and, well, he's just doing fine and you're both really expensive and I'm still a little bit upset about this. Apparently, Artex says this battery is five years old. I'm not exactly certain how they know that because I don't see any serial numbers or things on it. So I'm not certain, but that's what they told me on Twitter. So this should not happen. I, I don't care how crappy of a lithium battery that you have if you handle them properly like you keep them on a float charge where they're partially charged they don't ever die they don't ever get overcharged this should never happen this is dangerous uh, had this actually caught fire instead of just puffing up and getting angry at me this could have been considerably worse than it actually was so i'm very thankful that it didn't get there but uh, considering that we keep two of these in the case with the $20,000 scanner, I'm now rethinking how I keep these batteries with the scanners. So I'm going to buy more lithium bags. If anyone has brands that they, that they like to get fireproof lithium bags from, uh, leave them in the comments. You can't leave links because YouTube. But uh, if you've got any brands that you like to get lithium fire bags from, would really like some opinions right now because, uh, yeah, I'm a little bit bummed. This is $850 and no, there's literally nothing special about this. I don't understand how this could happen if I'm going through all proper protocol for lithium batteries. So if you got any tips on lithium storage, lithium charge, discharge, whatever things you might have, I'd love to know down in those comments because... I am really trying not to have that happen again because that the, the, that gets really expensive. One that I missed, uh, literally, <laughs> data filming exactly one month ago. Uh, sorry, Tim. He said, hey, 3D Musketeers, maybe something for hashtag print fix Friday. By the way, if you do want us to take a look at your fails, we'd love to help you out. You can use the hashtag print fix on all the social medias or you can actually make a video on YouTube and tag us in that video so we can take a look at it. Tim knows how to do it. He said, I've had this phenomenon of rippling several times now. In this case, I'm pretty sure it's the filament and not the printer. As you can see, it has occurred with both the Mark III and the XL, but it has only occurred with two different carbon fiber filaments so far, a CPECF and ASACF from different manufacturers. In addition, it seems to decrease over the course of the spool. You can see the spots where the spool was changed to a new one. When I saw it for the first time, I thought it was the bed breathing. So that's the PID loop where the bed might be expanding and contracting. But in the end, everything pointed to the filament. So I, I missed it. 
uh, I was going through my Twitter notifications and saw it. And so I asked. He said, I think the most plausible explanation is that it's a dry spool where the outer layers have already drawn some water again, which would explain why this phenomenon disappears at the course of the print. I just wonder why this wavy pattern appears instead of bubbles. I mean, if there had been some stringing and bubbles, I would have immediately thought about moisture. But since I've been printing directly from a dry box, it hasn't happened again. I don't have the answer either. It seems plausible. Something to note, that appears to be a brass nozzle, my boy. Which means that brass nozzle is nowhere near the size that it was when you first started the print, so be careful. Waviness toward the top of a part, I could say, okay, well maybe it's wiggling around a little bit, but like, dude, that print looks freaking gorgeous. It could also be the lighting, and as dumb as this is, the lighting can make it bad and make it look bad, but uh, this, this is very obvious, right? Where this looks good, that looks like crap. That's apparently where he changed out the spool. If printing from a dry box solves the problem, then screw it, problem solved. On a Mark 3S, a Mark 4, I could see the reasoning of it's, you know, the spool pulling on the extruder, but the XL doesn't do that. The XL is a reverse Bowden setup where there isn't excess force put on the extruder like that. So that problem doesn't exist on the XL and we still see this problem evident. If you are lighting from the top though, there could be that issue, but normally carbon fiber hides all layer lines and make things look absolutely beautiful. So if a dry box fixed it, I am perfectly happy to agree and say that it's a dry box and it, your filament was just absorbing a little bit of moisture. What do you guys think in those comments below? Because if a dry box solves it, fine. Maybe it needed more drag. Maybe you, you're not getting perfect extrusion, but that wouldn't cause the problem either. It's a really interesting one, especially because it goes away toward the center of the spool. It's like the machines are struggling to feed the filament. And the fact that it's consistent across two different printers, two different G codes, two different parts, I'm inclined to say that, yeah, if drying it fixed it, screw it. Maybe it was moisture. I don't know. Y'all let me know in those comments what you think of this one. I am still stumped to this day. I don't know. Just like I always question why we have so many awesome Patreon and YouTube channel members listed right next to me at the $5 tier and higher. Remember, if you want to support the efforts that we do here on the channel, you can do so by clicking those links in that description. Joining for as little as $1 a month. And hey, at the $10 tier and higher, you get to come hang out in our private Discord server with myself and the entire Musketeers crew where we do hangouts all the time. And... Uh, theoretically, if I have to drive back from Gainesville in a hurricane, uh, maybe we'll stream that. I don't know. It depends on who's driving. We'll see. Anyway, so I got for you all today. Hopefully, I will see you all at 3D Printopia. Uh, by now, I would have likely made a social media post, so, you know, who knows? Anyway, so I have for you all today. Stay safe out there. Don't forget to call your loved ones. And yes, I forgot to do an Earth, Wind, and Fire episode for the 21st of September. So, Earth, Wind, and Fire! See you later. <laughs> and that might adjust some traveling for us, but theoretically, we should be at Print Fix Friday. Oh my god, no. STOP MAKING FUN OF ME! <laughs>